Our guest this week is Ash Lazenby, Head of Cobalt for North America at Glencore. Glencore is the world's second largest cobalt producer, with mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Canada and Australia. It has supply agreements with a number of automotive companies, including Tesla and General Motors, as well as battery producers such as Samsung SDI. Glencore has also invested in US cobalt projects in recent years, as well as battery recycling in the country, as it looks to expand its presence in the electric vehicle supply chain. In this interview, Lazenby talks about why cobalt is still needed for the energy transition, the challenges of the current low price environment, and the potential of recycling to supply the cobalt market. Just before the interview, Lazenby talked on stage at Benchmark's Giga USA conference about the challenge that commodity price volatility poses for investors and in new mining projects. If we think about two, three years ago, you know, the conversations that we're having, lithium prices obviously were, were, were up through the roof, cobalt prices were up through the roof, nickel um, pretty similar. And then you wind forward two, three years time, they're all kind of in the gutter. And, um, and that's classic commodities, right? They are, they are cyclical and this is something that then provides the challenges, I think, for industry and others to actually move projects along on a, on a predictive timeline. But those charts will just do the opposite again, right? And everyone will be clambering. He also explained Glencore's position of not supplying the market if prices are too low. It's quite an unusual market because essentially you have um, almost everybody else who have actually taken of the order of 15% of global supply out of the market due to the fact that prices are low and then one entity that's basically um, done the same and some on the other side, right? Um, which, is, which is obviously um, a little bit of a, uh, you know, um, runs, runs, you know, uh, counter to the normal sort of supply uh, demand sort of dynamics. And Lazenby warned automakers not to become complacent about cobalt. You know, the complacency thing is a challenge. The analogy I'm always using with the, with the EV producers is like the chip, you know. The chip is not an overbearing cost in the vehicle, but if you don't have it, there was panic stations, and the same is true of these commodities, right? Mm. We call them critical minerals for a reason. Kasper Rawls, Chief Data Officer at Benchmark, sat down with him to learn more. Ash, thank you very much for agreeing to, to uh, speak with us today. Yes. We're obviously here in Washington, D.C., discussing uh, critical minerals, battery raw materials. We spoke about the raw material disconnect, so kind of lack of uh, build out of the upstream of the supply chain and, um, and actually some of the problems in the midstream as well. Um, can you give us some comments on how the U.S. is tackling the raw material disconnect or, or building out that supply chain and you know, what you think it could potentially do better? Yeah, sure. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, it must be great to be here as well, Casper. So um, once again, at a benchmark event. Um, I think, you know, if you, if you look at it, there have obviously been policy driven initiatives like the Inflation Reduction Act that have done fantastic things for um, quite a lot of the supply chain. I think, um, you know, one of the observations I would make is if you look at the supply chain in general, um, there's been quite a lot of things tackled on the downstream. I think as you progressively move up the supply chain, though, you get fewer instances of, of examples where that supply chain is being built out, whether that be in the United States, whether that also just generally be in the West. So obviously, you know, we're seeing gigafactories, we're seeing uh, cell production, we're seeing cathode material to some degree, but once you get up into that precursor, into the refining side, and obviously in the extractive side with, with the mines, obviously those, those examples are few and far between, particularly in certain commodities. And I think that's obviously, you know, like we always say, the clue is in the name, critical minerals. If you don't have those minerals, if you can't access those minerals, then you aren't able to actually produce ultimately the vehicle. And so that's that's really where I think the the West and, and the United States really needs to tackle that challenge because there is some endowment of resources, obviously in the United States, um, certain commodities exist to some degree. And then, and then obviously in, in the West at large, you know, there are actually physical sources of these commodities. So it's all about then how can you actually bring these commodities to fruition to ensure that there is a resilient supply chain within the West. Uh, you, you mentioned the West and, uh, you know, obviously we're here in Washington, D.C. and part of the discussion is around kind of, the, you know, political tension between China and the U.S. on, on, on this industry. Um, Glencore has a lot of customers in China, obviously being a big part of the supply chain. Um, you know, what do you think the learnings could be rather than seeing it's a competitive environment? What do you think the learnings could be from Chinese industry and Chinese policy that we could adopt over here that would help build out the supply chain? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's a bit of a classic example, really, of... of learning by doing. Um, and we've seen those comments quite often at the conference already, which is essentially that certain jurisdictions 
like this have actually uh, you know, lost the ability and the know-how to actually build these facilities. So there's no particular secret source, particularly when you're looking at the mining and the refining side around how you actually develop these sites. But a classic example I would use is what the Chinese have done in Indonesia around the high pressure acid leaching technology. Glencore actually was one of the early pioneers of that technology. We have a facility in Australia that produces nickel, produces cobalt. That material is used in electric vehicles today. And, and what the Chinese have done very successfully is they've, they've taken the next generation, you know, iteration two, pretty good, iteration three, better, iteration four, really, you know, really striking the balance on cost competitive, speed to market, all of these things. And you can essentially get that know-how where you can rotate teams in, you know, the same construction teams, the same commissioning teams, the same operational teams. And like everything, just like the gigafactory rollout that is going to happen in the United States, with that becomes know-how and economies of scale, which means that then you have a, you know, a competitive industry that can also compete with, you know, the likes of other jurisdictions who have essentially taken a decade plus uh, leapfrog, really, or or advance on on you know other Western jurisdictions. You know, we've discussed the raw material side, but obviously then there's the other side of the supply chain, right? It's the demand side. Um, we've focused on the North, you know, for this discussion, focused on the North American or US market. How do you view the, the technology roadmap here for vehicles? Obviously, um, you know, different cathode needs for different vehicles. Um, and how do you plan for that? You know, when you're thinking about you know, building out these operations, which in many cases can take a, a long time, it can take five, 10 or more years. How do you plan to kind of right size those investments around that kind of shifting roadmap of technology that automakers are constantly looking at and tweaking and adjusting? I think, you know, you have you have step changes, if you like, in technology where you talk about solid state and, and, and various other technologies. I think there is a there is a long runway though to to actually really fully implementing those technologies. And as as you guys do with 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 the data sets, right? The the level of demand that we're really talking about by the time these technologies are really in the commercial space at scale. There's, there's, there's room really for, for, for everyone um, from the perspective of just the, the sheer level of demand that's required. I think as you then think about nickel, cobalt, lithium, um, the fact that the demand is so, so big, it's not really a, a challenge you need to think about too much given the fact that you know, you're, you're really running from such a, a low base, if you like, in terms of actually trying to scale these, these operations that you know, demand is not going to be an issue for, for, these, uh, for these production facilities as you think about it over the next sort of 10 to 15 years. You know, it takes a long time. We've, we've seen it as well. We've, we've got relationships with the EV producers and we have done for a long time. Um, you know, technologies also from a commercial point of view tend to be quite sticky, right? On the, on the basis that um, you know, once you have something that's readily adopted, obviously there's, there's quite a runway to then adopting something else beyond you know, the lab scale and moving it through the commercial into then your sort of incumbent um, you know, uh, key technology, if you like, within, within your actual electric vehicle. So I would say it's one of those, it's one of those points where the market needs to be careful thinking. You, you hear it sometimes in cobalt, you know, well, we'll, we'll try and innovate away from cobalt or engineer it out. In reality, what is really happening today is, of course, cobalt quantity in, in per electric vehicle is lower. But you know, when you talk about nickel cobalt bearing batteries, which is still the most significant part of, of, the, um, of the chemistry set and certainly the largest um, from a Western perspective, you know, your cobalt level may be low, but then you multiply it by the number of vehicles. And in absolute terms, cobalt's a small market, you know, and you're talking about tens of thousands of tons. So I, I draw an analogy sometimes with the chip industry, you know, and the OEMs when speaking to the car companies about the fact that, you know, the value of that chip in a vehicle is not insurmountable um, from an economics point of view. But if you don't have it, you have challenges. And the same is true of any of these critical minerals. You know, cobalt may be 100 bucks in a vehicle, but if you don't have that cobalt in the right form, then the, the other, you know, five, ten thousand dollars that's gone into the, the cell, the battery at large, you know, it all it all doesn't work. And so you've got to be careful just thinking because the value per vehicle might be low in certain areas that therefore it's not something that you should be tracking and make sure that you're sourcing. Yeah, I guess. And uh, on that note, so obviously current market dynamics in, in cobalt today is we're in a period of oversupply. There's, there, you know, that low price environment. <laughs> Um, I don't know if you can talk about that to some extent, like how, how you view it, but also um, 
Do you, you know, good to hear your thoughts on, do you think there's a misguided sense of comfort around cobalt sourcing in the market today, purely on the basis of the, the, the environment we're in? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think if you look at supply and demand today, you certainly have a supply theme playing out, right? The market has clearly been oversupplied. There's one particular company that's obviously producing a lot of material. Um, obviously, Glencore has actually, you know, lowered our general output. I think we've we've consistently said in our commodities, you know, that essentially these are finite resources, and if the market is 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 not requiring them immediately, then why pull the tons out of the ground, right? Save them for the future. So we've scaled back a little bit in our production, um, but you do have one entity that is producing a lot of tons. What's interesting and quite unusual is on the other side, you've got the market that's really responded quite heavily in terms of supply cuts. So you've actually had about 15% of global supply come out of the market, but the net has been a supply addition because of you know, that particular producer. But at the same time, you know, that producer is going through the bulk of its ramp this year, and then there aren't too many um, growth projects that are imminent thereafter. And that's a natural consequence you know, like we always see of the investment cycles, right, in terms of what's really moving the needle or not. Um, and then the challenge you had actually cobalt for, for the last couple of years was was a demand issue. You know, you had a bit of a demand shock um, as China came out of the zero COVID policy. People weren't buying cell phones. And it's something that people often forget in cobalt. Two thirds of demand is, is lithium ion batteries. Half of that is consumer goods, it's cell phones, it's iPads, all of those sorts of products. EVs is around the same. And so, you know, if, if, the, if the whole cell phone market starts drying up, then obviously that's a demand shock. Your supply continues. And even if supply and demand from there on are moving double digit growth on both, you know, demand's been great, but you're out of lockstep. And so you need one of those synchronizing events then to occur, which is obviously, you know, what we're going to see over, um, over, the coming, over the coming years. I think it's, it's interesting to see just today, actually, I saw the headlines, you know, Apple's up about five or six percent today. People are getting excited because of AI enabled cell phones again, you know, and the fact that people may be upgrading their cycle of, um, of phones where maybe they haven't been. And this is one of those classic things in commodities, right, where you get these dynamics then where you get a bit of a demand swing. And, um, you know, depending on the timing, that's where you can really obviously suck up um, some of those excess units from the market, let alone the EVs, which is obviously something that's a real bedrock to the demand dynamic anyway. Yeah. So you touched on in your last answer, you touched on the fact that, um, you know, once current the, the large projects that are ramping today have kind of reached their, their peak output, there's really not you know, much more in terms of large scale operations that we're expecting to come to market in the near term. Um, we're in a relatively low price environment. I don't know if you can comment on you know, your outlook from here when you see the market rebalancing and, and you know, broad outlook for kind of pricing going forward. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think if you, if you look at pricing, clearly now we're around those historical lows, right? And you see the market digesting that and, and looking at it, is there really more, is there more downside really to come? Clearly the upside from here is, is more extensive than the downside. The interesting dynamic that you also start to see at these pricing levels is other demand groups actually showing a lot of interest, right? There's, there's tangible financial interest now in, um, in the commodity. You know, you've seen it in uranium. You've obviously seen various investment houses talking about looking at physical storage of these critical minerals where you're seeing exactly the same in, in, in cobalt. The other point is, you know, that's financial, but you also have governmental stockpiling. Um, if you look at, you know, China, you know, the, the, the rumors on China is that there's going to be a substantial stockpiling again this year. So between the Chinese stockpiling, one or two other smaller stockpilings by governments, plus the financial side, you could have a demand source for cobalt that's, that's akin to about 10% of global demand from stockpiling one way or another this year, where that was basically a rounding error um, a couple of years ago. And what that sort of tells you is that you know, people appreciate the fact that actually these commodities are cyclical, we're, we're at cyclical lows, and that now is an interesting opportunity to actually you know, build some level of strategic stockpile. It's, it's obviously a conversation we're always seeing in DC as well around critical minerals and, and the, you know, the sensible time at which to actually stockpile for the future, right? And help, I guess, de-risk the, the, the supply chain at large. Sadly, we're, we're just not seeing much of the actions that, you know, so bring it back to the US and, and kind of domestic supply growth. What do you think are the, the main levers uh, that the US government could pull to help bring operations to, to the US market? Is that, is that permitting? Is that finance? Is it, what, is it you know, capital? What is it? What is it that can really help speed up that, that deployment? For sure, I think you know, permitting reform and, and, and a sort of 
well-defined permitting uh, process and structure. I think any any world-class mining company like like ours would say it's it's obviously very important to have a rigorous uh, permitting regime, consultation with with local institutions, stakeholders, everybody else. Um, however, that doesn't mean that it needs to be the case where if there is something where there's some contentious element that things are held up, held up for a, you know, a year, held up for two years, and you basically start to get an unpredictable timeline. You know, if, if a project makes sense, if economically it makes sense, but it's also you know, good and, and it's you know, gainful for communities and otherwise, then these are things that should really be actively explored. I think the challenge today is for most mining companies and, and others is, is that predictability of, of the timing. The other point where we've seen, you know, other governments uh, outside of the West do very well has been the ability to actually deploy long term capital uh, cheaply and on, on a stable basis. You know, this is, at the end of the day, we see these cycles in commodities in the electric vehicle supply chain at large. And it can't be all borne by, uh, I think, the, you know, the, the actual supply chain, because, of course, they're also to some degree at the mercy and, and, and whim of the, the capital cycle as well. You know, you need to see um, a level of, you know, large scale capital that almost says, look, we understand, you know, in the first one or two years that there, there's not necessarily a criteria of return here, right? It's about looking at the, fi the fifth year, the sixth year, as we go into the 10 years, the longer vision of how you can actually establish these supply chains. And that's obviously, you know, beholden to governments to, to actually help facilitate this and I think the other the other point is, you know, you've seen a general dynamic of flight of Western capital from developing countries. So you obviously have some level of resource endowment in the United States, in North America. We produce cobalt and nickel in, in, in Canada, for example. But, you know, the, the tonnages are, are only so big. There are obviously a lot of resources in the developing world, but generally Western capital has not wanted to go there. We're actually one of the few examples of the major diversifiers where we've kind of stuck to it in developing countries, whereas others have left. And, you know, I think that's a challenge because shareholders have a certain risk aversion to the developing countries. And it's a, it's a little bit, you know, the wrong way around in a way, because this is how you solve for these problems. But you're not really incentivized to actually access the developing countries because of you know risk and, and otherwise. And of course, you know, friendly governments can help with that. And, and there, there can be collaboration to, to get a good sense of fiscal structure and collaboration, you know, in developing countries, which obviously helps you know, those entities as well, like, you know, the work that we do in the DRC with our local communities is fantastic, right? It's big employment where it's most needed as well. And I think it's, you know, in, in some ways, a lot of the communities have it have it the wrong way in the West when they talk about these things, because actually, the, you know, people should be actively looking to invest in the developing countries where they possibly can. Yeah, so Glencore's like relatively uniquely positioned. You have obviously extraction, mining operations, trading operations, but also quite a big recycler as well, which I don't know if many people are aware of, but Glencore is a very big recycler, particularly here in North America. How do you see, how is that playing into like your portfolio? Does that generate extra interest from certain customers? Obviously, Apple have been quite public about wanting to use all recycled cobalt in their, in their devices. Mm. Um, I don't know if you can talk about how you see that as part of the business and where you think going forward, you know, how much of the supply chain will be will be supplied by recycled operations or recycled material. Yeah, I mean, it's got a very clear, um, you know, point within the and, and role to play within within the, the the whole cycle for electric vehicles or otherwise. Like you say, we're already a large, very significant um, recycler, not just around lithium ion batteries, but also electronic scrap as well. Um, and we have been for for a long time. And, and I think that's an area where we're we're clearly looking to grow, whether that be through our own recycling facilities or whether that be looking for, for partners where we've invested, like Lifecycle, like um, US Strategic Metals, where you're, you're essentially looking to take spent batteries and, and obviously return back the, 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 battery, uh, the battery materials for, for the next, for the next uh, cells. And I think it, it, is, um, it fits quite neatly because, of course, you can also have those conversations with electric vehicle producers around new materials, but also how can you close the loop for them as well? Right? How can you take that production scrap as they ramp their gigafactories, which is clearly going to be something that's going to scale very materially in the next two, three years, and wrap that up as, a, as ideally a complete package where you can say, OK, great, we can deliver you the lithium, the nickel, the cobalt. Here's you know a bunch of material that's that's new, and here's a bunch of material that that is also your your spent batteries, and 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 obviously closing the loop. Now in an ideal world, 
we'd be using 100% recycled material. The challenge is just today that obviously there's not enough of it around. So um, end of life battery is obviously generally pretty scarce because you haven't produced enough of the electric vehicles yet. That'll come in time. And, and I think one of the other points there is that, you know, you are going to see these electric vehicles you already do very well engineered, you know, to say that you're going to have an abundance of end of life batteries in five years. It, it won't be the case. Right. But what you do see is end of life batteries in, from other applications, but also production scrap as these gigafactories ramp as well, which is obviously, you know, can be quite material tonnages. But as a rule of thumb, you're still the vast majority of your materials you're going to need to source from um, from extractive industry. And, and so marrying the two makes a lot of sense. And obviously, I think Glencore will be there so long as, you know, there's there's a sufficient market to say, look, we should be scaling more recycling facilities. Yeah, it's, it's something that we're actively looking to expand upon, building on the relationships and the partnerships we already have in the United States. Great. OK, well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. No worries. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. And, yeah. Um, yeah, Likewise. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>